and then we call it spin orbit. Usually, uh, I avoid the word. In the beginning, I, always, I, I avoided a lot the word entanglement for this. And this is because it generated a lot of confusion. But most people now is uh, well uh, uh, acquainted to what means classical non-separability and what is genuine quantum entanglement. So we can talk about this uh, more or less informally, but the best would be maybe to call this spin orbit non-separability. Okay, but I, would, I will insist on this word here just to stress the analogy between the two, okay? So essentially, the, the simplest way to talk about entanglement in, the, in, the, in quantum mechanics is when you combine two quantum systems and you have this tensor product structure uh, of the vector space of the combined system, you have for example, when general uh, global states are uh, of, the, of the combined system is, can be written as a tensor product, it's a, just a factorized state, it's a separable state. When you are, but when you combine the systems, of course, we know that well, there are more than just separable states. We, we end up with also with the possibility of states that cannot be factorized and this gives rise to the concurrence. To the, to the, I'm sorry, to the entangled states, like for example the Bell states, uh, and this for a pair of qubits, uh, most of you uh, know already that you can quantify for pure states, you can quantify the amount of entanglement by using the concurrence that varies between zero for separable states to one for maximally entangled states, such as the Bell states. But so far, we have the same kind of mathematical structure on the spatial uh, degree of freedom of a paraxial beam and the polarization degree of freedom. And if I am to build a general uh, profile of a uh, paraxial beam, of course I can conceive, I, I will uh, form the space of uh, paraxial modes by combining the polarization space and the spatial space, uh, uh, vector space. And then, of course, I have structures that cannot be factorized. They cannot be factorized. So mathematically, it's completely equivalent. Mathematically, it's equi completely equivalent to the, the case that we have in quantum mechanics. And we can even build what it would be the, the, the analogous to the uh, bell modes, to, to the bell states, right, which we call here like bell modes. So this H and V, they refer for Hamid Gaussian modes that are horizontally uh, oriented or vertically oriented. So I have here a combination, a coherent combination between H, H and V, V with plus or minus and here uh, combinations of H, V with plus or minus. So this forms what would be equivalent to the four bell states that we have over there. And again, if I talk about a general paraxial beam where I describe everything, the spatial structure and the vector uh, nature of the field, of course, I can, uh, in some sense, uh, quantify the amount of non-separability, this structural non-separability, uh, by the concurrence. We take the coefficients here, as long as the, the the, the, the beam that you are dealing with is completely coherent, within the coherent uh, length of the laser, for example, we can describe it as a pure, what would be equivalent to a pure state, and quantify the amount of non-separability using the, the concurrence. But what does it mean to have this kind of uh, non-separable structures? So physically, what does it mean to have modes that cannot be, the, the, to have such bell modes? So what's interesting is that they give rise to very beautiful patterns of proper polarization, polarization patterns. So these are beams that, in which the polarization changes from point to point. And the four bell modes, they, they, are, they have these kind of polarization patterns. These are obviously called the radial polarization. So at each point of the hollow intensity distribution, okay, 
uh, uh, but uh, uh, be careful. This is uh, uh, this has the, the 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 same hollow intensity distribution as a Laguerre Gaussian mode, but it's not a Laguerre Gaussian mode. Okay, it's a non-separable structure. So at each point we have linear polarization, but the direction uh, of the linear polarization varies from one point to the other. It's always point radially. Okay. Again, if we follow a radial line here, all points have the same direction, the same polarization, and they all meet in the middle. So now we have a, a vector singularity in this beam. So this, this is why it's also called a vector vortex, or a vector beam. While in the case of Laguerre Gaussian mode, it was the phase, a scalar variable that was not defined in the middle. Okay? So here, the phase is the, the polarization direction. And again, nature is wise enough not to put energy where you have ill-defined properties of the structure. So this one is the azimuthal polarization. The polarization turns around the propagation direction. And those two, they, they are counter-rotating. So the, the difference is that in, in those two here, you start with a given polarization. And then as you turn around the beam, the polarization turns in the same sense. Those other two, you start with some polarization, and as you turn around the beam, the polarization turns in the opposite sense. So those two, we call them counter-rotating, while the radial and azimuthal, we call them co-rotating. Okay? So we, we can generate this in the lab. We have now available, uh, commercially available, what is called an S-plate from Gaussian input beam. It will generate a radially polarized and then we can, we can use quantum information. We know that once you, you get in the maximally entangled state, you can obtain all maximally entangled states by local transformation. So once we get in the radio polarization, we can do all of, all, uh, uh, we can uh, transform to any kind of non-separable mode only with the polarization if we want. Okay, so this is very useful. Now let's uh, push a bit uh, 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 more this analogy between this structural non-separability in classical optics and uh, quantum inform information in quantum mechanics. So let's do it, for example, in the context of polarimetry. So uh, while people in quantum information is used to talk about tomography, uh, how do you characterize uh, the quantum state of a, a one qubit, if you don't know which state you, are having, uh, you have, and then you want to, dis, uh, to somehow characterize your source of quantum states, you do tomography. Well, people in classical optics, they have been doing polarimetry, which is essentially the same for years. So, so essentially, the idea is you take the, the Bloch sphere or the Poincaré sphere, what you need is to obtain uh, the coordinates of your state on this sphere. So for example, you can uh, characterize the polarization state by making these kinds of measurements. You project the polarization in, with a polarizer with a polarizer, you can project in a linear polarizer oriented at horizontal or vertical, and you just measure the, the transmitted intensities, normalized by the total intensity, and then you have the so-called Stokes parameters. They will have Stokes parameter S1. Then you do the same with the linear polarizer oriented at 45 degrees or minus 45 degrees. You have S2. And if we precede the linear polarizer with a quarter wave plate, then you can measure the intensities in red and left, uh, left and right-handed polarized circular polarizations. The difference between those two will give the parameter S3. The S1, S2, and S3 will be the Cartesian uh, coordinates of the point you are in, on the Poincaré sphere. So this completes the tomography. So these are the, 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 the quantities that you need to measure okay, to, to find out whether this, this beam is polarized or not. 
and which polarization it has. Okay? So the same can be done. We can in, in pre, formally we can conceive the same quantities for the for the orbital part. Okay? I can suppose that I have some kind of spatial filter that only leaves Hermit Gaussian, horizontally Hermit Gaussian modes uh, to pass, and I measure the transmitted intensity. And then I do the same for a mid Gaussian V, for a mid Gaussian plus 45 degrees, minus 45 degrees, and then for Laguerre Gaussian right and left handed. And then I can build a set of Stokes parameters that will serve to also characterize the orbital mode on the corresponding Poincaré sphere. Okay? So that's how we do in the in the lab, polarization measurements, we just precede a polarizing beam splitter that transmits horizontally polarized beams, reflects vertically polarized beam. If we want, we can precede the, the polarizing beam splitter with a wave plane, uh, to measure more general basis, and then we take the intensity difference. With this, we measure S1, S2, S3, and they must satisfy this inequality here. S1 square, S2 square, S3 square, much added up, must be smaller or equal to 1. Okay? Uh, if they equal 1, then you say that the beam is fully polarized with some amount of, with some polarization state that depends on the individual values of S1, S2, S3, S3 but you say that it's fully polarized. If, it's, if it gives you 0, then you say that it's non-polarized. It would be like the light coming from this lamp, okay? And this unpolarized beam is what be, would be equivalent to a mixed state of a single qubit mixed state in quantum mechanics. Okay. How do we, how do, we do with the orbital part? So, first, we have to uh, uh, think, uh, w w the, the simplest way to do tomography in the orbital part would be with interferometric techniques. And then that's what I'm going to explain now. To, to, choose, to see how it works, we just uh, uh, check what a simple reflection on a mirror do with each degree of freedom. So if I have a, I have a horizontally polarized beam that is uh, reflected in the horizontal plane, then the vector, the, the, the unit vector, the polarization unit vector gets a sign, uh, a minus sign. If it's vertically polarized, so perpendicular to the plane of, the, uh, of incidence, then it doesn't get any sign here. Well, the same happens to the Hermit Gaussian modes. A Gaussian mode doesn't, a, ga a normal Gaussian mode like this laser beam doesn't suffer any, its, it's spatial structure doesn't change because it Symmetry, reflection symmetry. However, the two lobes of the emit Gaussian modes, actually, they are pi out of phase. They have a pi phase shift between the two lobes. They have the same intensity, but they are pi out of phase. So every time I invert the lobes, the beam gets a minus sign. So a horizontal emit Gaussian beam gets a minus sign when it's a uh, reflected, and the vertical doesn't have anything. Or anything. So then what you can do, you can place, for example, you can do a mass Zender interferometer where you put an additional mirror in one arm, like this. So when you count uh, the number of reflections, there is a difference between the number of reflections uh, in the two arms in such a way that when the the different uh, the, the path difference in the two arms of the interferometer when it matches an integer number of wavelengths, then you you can sort the uh, modes like like those the H H and V V so Hermit Gaussian horizontal with horizontal polarization Hermit Gaussian vert uh, vertical with vector polarization they go, those two go to one arm the other one the other two they go to the other arm. So I can sort them, okay? But this is a, this is a global uh, operation. It de it's dependent on both polarization 
end uh, orbital part. Okay? Uh, if you put a, uh, a wave plate oriented at zero degrees, so that compensate uh, the, 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 the pi phase shift of the polarization part, then you end up with just a mode, spatial mode selector. Okay, so this would be this this setup here would be the equivalent of a polarizing beam splitter, but for emit Gaussian modes. It will sort age emit Gaussian modes to one uh, arm and vertical emit Gaussian modes to the other arm, irrespective to the polarization state. So this is the way in which you can make projections in this spatial part. As we do it, uh, so this would be the case. That's the, the, the inner product. Uh, so you, you suppose that you come in with some general uh, spatial profile here, and, and what you are going to get, so you have the, the, the interferometer to uh, sort age and V modes, and you can use a mode converter. You can precede interferometer with a mode converter to measure general basis in the same way that you precede a, a polarizing beam splitter with a wave plate to measure general basis in general basis. So when you do that, uh, you can access all the three uh, Stokes parameters of the orbital part. So this is the way to do this in the lab and to do the tomography. Yes, please. Microphone. I'm going to go and ask a stupid question um, at the risk of being embarrassed. On the previous slide, I couldn't see why the, on the left, what's different between spatial and, and, and orbital and spin that you, you get those outputs? Because you have the same phase shifts for both, and I couldn't see. No, this is all. Oh, well, the point is that, for example, here, you, for this one, you get a minus sign from polarization and a minus sign from the spatial part. So minus times minus, this makes a plus. Okay. And, and the VV also makes a plus. So you, you have to compute the product. What, what is the sign that is acquired by the product? Okay. Because in the decomposition of the input beam, you have a sum of products. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Thanks. Sure. So, uh, this is the way we can measure the Stokes parameters for the orbital part if we want. And, as I said, this is the analogous of the state tomography in quantum information. So we take a general single qubit density matrix. Uh, we have the constraints that the, density the, 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 the diagonal is real because it's Hermitian. They add up to one. Or rho BA is the complex conjugate of rho AB. And so this leaves you with three independent parameters, which are exactly the Stokes parameters, the same as the Stokes parameters. So you make projections. Uh, you have this, the eigen, eigenstates of sigma x uh, and sigma y. So you can make projections on these, on these three mutually unbiased basis. So what we need for polarization in the orbital part is also three mutually unbiased bases. Okay, so for example, for the orbital part, the Hamid Gaussian HV plus and minus 45 and the two counter-rotating Lagrange Gaussian modes, they form three mutually unbiased bases. Okay, so this is what you need to complete this, the, the tomographic measurement find the Stokes parameters and relate the Stokes to the coordinates on the Poincaré sphere, there you go. Okay? So it's the same that we do in, in polarimeter. So let's now try to investigate what happens to this kind of structural non-separability when we try to, to make polarimetry on those vector beams, those vector vortices. Okay, like the, the, the bell modes that I mentioned. Okay.